Okay, guys, so my name is Chris Broomhead. I'm a personal trainer in Manchester in the UK, and my brand is a bit bespoke bodies personal training. So I'm a personal trainer and online coach. Uh, and I'm trying to now go into the, the market of trying to use a safer usage model when it comes to performance enhancement and trying to be open and honest with all the things that we're doing to try and help educate people a little bit further in this whole pursuit of what we're doing because there's been such bad information out there for so long that I feel it's, it's our responsibility now to start openly talking about things to really help people on the way forward. I've been personal training for five years now. We're starting to move more and more online as time goes on because obviously we're expanding outside of our local areas and obviously meeting Victor here who's on the other side of the world allows us to really connect with some other people. So that's how we're here today. Awesome. Victor, do you wanna yeah, uh, so just by way of quick introduction, any, anyone that doesn't know me, my name is Victor Black. Uh, I uh, have been uh, in this industry for about 35 years now, as uh, I began very much as a, a natural trainer. Um, in the last uh, few years, I've been building my profile, I suppose, as a, an educator of enhancement practices. My, uh, my great passion is trying to talk about what I consider to be safer use practices. Um, I, I just before we lead off in the, into the conversation we're going to have today, I just wanted to make a couple of points that I think are really important. You'll never hear me talk about that doesn't work. N nothing mm. I'm here to communicate to people is about that doesn't work and what I tell you works better. You know, most people that talk about anabolic steroids, most you know, so-called educators, and 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 I. And I, I I use, I use that term with, with respect, but I mean, like, really what they're debating is the minutia of efficacy. What, what works better? You know, so this works better than that. And, and my whole message is trying to say, look, I'm not here to, 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 to tell you that that's not going to work. I'm here to say, look, is it possible that as users of these types of products that we can uh, deploy them in in a manner that might potentially lower our risk profile. So very much about safer practices in, in the enhancement world. Um, and I, I had a call with uh, Chris, a, a consulting call with Chris, I think two, two weeks ago now, yeah. maybe three. Yeah, I'm not sure ago. on timer, yeah. And uh, we kind of uh, mentioned that maybe maybe we should take another call and, and, and run this in a podcast type format with a you know, bit of kind of Q&A type thing. Chris had some really insightful and interesting questions that I, I feel that our our tribe, our community should perhaps, you know, listen in on. Um, I think there's there's value in that communication. So we agreed to kind of make make this call and um and I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Chris lead off the discussion and um I will do my best to answer any questions he brings up and you know and uh, see if we can see if we can provide some some educational content and and value for for listeners on today's call. Yeah, and I think it's it's incredibly important these days that the the old fashioned attitude of don't do that, it's bad for you, and and being quite narrow minded and ignorant to these subjects is is just not going to work. People are inquisitive, and access to everything is so available these days. I mean, you can go on Instagram, and if you don't find it in five minutes, someone's probably going to throw it at you. <laughs> but, you know, and and then it, 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 we 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 laugh because it's it's ridiculous how easy it is, but then unsuspecting people are falling victim to essentially been putting this in the in the firing line from what is most likely drug dealers half the time mm -hmm. and they're getting the poor advice and we're just trying to get the safer usage advice out there and trying to say to people okay if you're going to go down this route let's just do it a bit more safely instead of let's just just take this and take that i don't even know what i'm taking i'm not even thinking about five or ten years time and then big health issues are hitting people down the line and they're not understanding why. Mm. And obviously now we've got a bit of data there from the fact that these health issues have been cropping up now for the last 10, 15 years because people have gone way over the top in their usage. It's probably completely irresponsible. But obviously our discussions and where me and Victor have met and our sort of the tribe of people that we are in have started to understand how these health co how outcomes have come about and therefore how can we try and prevent them from, from happening in the first place. So there's quite let, me, let me just add something in yeah. there, Chris. I think I think it's important for people to, because you just don't hear people talking about this. Very often, our tribe will look back with rose-colored glasses at the 1970s golden era of bodybuilding and say, "Well, you know, back in the day, they used to, you know, 
practice more moderate you know application of these tools and I, I think it's important to be very transparent very honest um and to say you know like honestly in the 1970s they didn't have a fucking clue what they were doing oh. right <laughs> so it is fair to say it, it's 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 a fair observation to say that on average probably the total milligram load that was used for anabolic steroids was less than competitive bodybuilders today i think that's fair yeah, yeah? I would say. but i also think it's fair to say two things one is it's not like everyone did one thing everyone followed a a, a, a vanilla model i think it's mm. far more accurate to say just like today there are moderate users in our tribe there are you know average users in our tribe and there are extreme users in our tribe and in my opinion they always have been right from the get-go yeah. so this idea that back in the 70s they did I, I think that's naive that's like saying back in the 90s they did I think in the 90s in every era of of enhanced bodybuilding there has been moderate use there has been you know mid-level use we'll say that call it intermediate levels and there's been extreme I, th I think that's yeah. true right from the beginning. Yeah. But the most important thing would be the understanding of the pharmacology and the understanding of the, the, the toxicology. In other words, the, the negative effect of these drugs in the 1970s was, was appalling, horrible, <laughs> horrible. They, yeah. they literally, in my opinion, were following what I consider to be the highest possible risk model there is, which is, look, we don't have a fucking clue what these drugs are going to do. Yeah. They appear... <laughs> through um clinical you know application at the time remembering that these testosterone derivatives effectively um were developed and deployed in clinical application yeah so they were aware of some clinical literature and obviously some individuals had the support of health care providers but the amount of practical real world application knowledge that they had about you know exposure durations and 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 consequences of you know high level use was 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 completely non-existent basically you know and so i i don't agree when i hear people say back back in the day sort of thing it was better i think back in the day they were fucking nuts <laughs> i mean well even even the stories from the 90s it was it was a lot of dan duchene obviously if anyone's heard dan duchene was kind of a pioneer of of a lot of these drugs and he was sure. kind of finding them in medical literature and going okay try this and see what happens and the, but then if we'd listen to the stories from a lot of the bodybuilders, especially in California, there was a lot of drug addiction and there was a lot of deaths and there was a lot of really bad health problems. And this is where our data really starts to collect mm. from the mental effects, the internal damage we're causing, mm. um, whether it be the heart, the kidneys, the liver, which is obviously what we want to cover today, because there's, there's some of the guys I'm hearing in the gym and it's, it, it's guys that don't even look like they're taking anything, but their perception is such a blase attitude towards all kinds of drugs so then it's recreational drugs performance enhancing drugs and high dosages of everything because mm. they've walked in the gym and they have not been educated on how to take things not been educated on what a dosage is and it's just like okay test 400 and, I t and, and how much you take oh i take two mil of this and two mil of this so how many milligrams is that uh, mm. i don't know you know and and uh, they're they just so unaware of what they're actually doing and especially in the long term, and they're having these big roller coasters of, of hormone levels when they're trying the PCT and they're not even affected the PCT and the mental effects that's having as well. And some of the stories I'm hearing are just quite shocking. This last 12 months, especially as I've been more open, people have been more open back. Mm, that's and it's just, yeah, yeah there's a scream that we need to start educating people because they're really going to do themselves some harm in the long run if we don't. Mm. So that's cool. why we're starting this today. Very good. All right. Why don't you lead us off? What, 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 are we, what are we going to discuss first? So obviously we've got a list of questions here. We'll hopefully get through as many as we can. Depends how, how long we'll take to cover each one. But we're going to start on heart health because a lot of this stuff that we've got, things like beta blockers and, and blood pressure medication, does link back into heart health anyway. Mm -hmm. So I'd say um, I was involved in a cardiac study, which has been put on pause due to lockdown. So it's a bit unfortunate because it was trying to collect data on competitive level bodybuilders who take performance enhancement and the effects that has on their heart. So mm -hmm. it's having ultrasounds and ECGs and things like this, trying to collect this data that at this point doesn't exist because we're trying to take the data, which obviously Victor does a lot of, and put it into practice and then see what happens with our, with our group and then collect the anecdotal evidence from what's going on. So, mm -hmm. I mean, Victor, how, what would you say in terms of 
the if, even if you're starting on testosterone, for example, how does that affect your heart in terms of your blood pressure, your red blood cell counts, and all the things that it's going to increase? And then how would that have an effect, in your opinion? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think it's probably important to start to say, look, there are seven separate androgen toxicologies that we we need to consider. One of those is the impact on 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 the uh, the cardiovascular system and and cardiac health specifically yeah and they're like most disease states whether it's alzheimer's disease or whether it's obesity whether it's type 2 diabetes i think it's fair to say that most disease states are a result of multifactorial inputs yeah right? and when we look at the potential negative influence of androgens on cardiac health it can come from many angles so stating the obvious let's begin with the easy one it's very well documented in clinical evidence and it's very well understood in, in, in real world practice that the application of androgens has the potential to elevate blood pressure. Yeah. Okay. Which is so, really, obviously if you explain more to what's going Correct. On. So, so I think most people like whether, even if they don't have any understanding of enhancement practices at all would be, have been drilled home the message of like, you know what, walking around in a hypertensive state is, is simply not a good idea. You're like, I, I don't know that we need to, you know, drill into that too much. Like the idea that elevated systolic and bloody uh, and, and diastolic blood pressure is going to have potential negative or deleterious consequences on a cardiac health. You mean mm. that would begin the process then of what we would call cardiac remodeling. And cardiac remodeling is basically physical changes to the structure of the heart based on stimulatory input so even even elevated blood pressure okay not only is it uh you know deleterious to arterial health but it's also deleterious to the actual cardiac tissue itself. and then we would put a layer on top of that that would basically talk about and this is where i i talk a tremendous amount about the implications of the elevation of the effector molecule of the renin angiotensin two system, sorry, of the renin uh, angiotensin system, the effector molecule angiotensin two, and our need to suppress this molecule. So, which um, back blood vessels? Yeah, well, it 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 does like most things in biology. Again, it's multifactorial. It does many things. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's fair to say that the elevation of angiotensin II is something that we we wish to avoid. It's not our friend. And the simplest, I, I will try throughout this conversation to use, to use the the layman's explanation of things. So anyone listening to this as a you know a, a medical background or you know biologist or something may say that I'm look I'm 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 dumbing this down too much. But I think it's important when we're communicating to our tribe that we keep things you know like at at a, at a level that everybody can understand. And then potentially have follow-on conversations for those that are interested mm. at, a, at, a, at a deeper level. I'm very passionate about those conversations, but I have become very mindful over the last year or so that maybe some of the content I put out is too technical for the masses. So I'm trying my best to communicate something. So if we say uh, the angiotensin II molecule basically is something that we want to suppress, the best way to, for me to explain the importance of that molecule is if you look at pretty much the best known blood pressure medications in the world, they fall into two categories. Uh, one category is called uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. These are called ACE inhibitors. Uh, Ramapril would be an example of that. And then there's a second class of uh, hypertension medications basically referred to as angiotensin receptor blockers. Now, the fact that angiotensin is in, in, the, in the naming of both of those, you know, those classes of compounds kind of gives some you know, layman's insight to the fact that those molecules are fucking, that, that, that effect the molecule is the bad boy. This is what we're trying to suppress when we apply hypertensive medications of those classes. Um, there a are- A lot of people have actually been scared of those medications. Especially that's the especially bizarre thing it's like you know like uh, the, the, the number of people that i've met that believe that the goal here should be to not have to use these things when in reality the truth is you should be using a angiotensin 2 suppression uh, medication treatment model if you were, basically by default if you're going to be using super physiological levels of androgens and and one could even argue other enhancement products and the reason behind that is this we know that angiotensin II elevates blood pressure to begin with, 
we know that angiotensin two is damaging to our kidneys through a through a cascade. We know that angiotensin two is really the underlying mechanism behind cardiac remodeling, like left ventricular hypertrophy. We know this. This is this is not a secret, right? Yeah, it's not opinion. This, it's fact. Yeah, correct. Very, very easy to demonstrate with clinical literature. This is simply true. And um, then secondary to that, you have to take into account the fact that we also know that the application of anabolic steroids or androgens raises angiotensin too. So this is like one plus one is how low. This is a really fucking simple conversation to have. Okay. So the question obviously is uh, all about, so, you know, potentially what methodology might we use to try to suppress the elevation of angiotensin two? Should we use an ARB? Should we use an ACE inhibitor? Which one should we use? What is the dose that we should use? Clearly there's a cascade of questions and discussions that spill from that. But I think it's fair to say at first pass, the application of these drugs raises angiotensin two, which is something that we, we do not desire and we should be taking measures to pr protect our heart and our kidneys, because these drugs are kidney protective as well, um, against the impact of both blood pressure elevation and the elevation of angiotensin two. That, that's, I think, a, a fair introduction to the discussion. And we yeah. obviously then could drill into that and pull that apart and into you know, layers as deep as anyone wants to go. And I, and I would encourage anyone to basically have that conversation. What I did hope to do to, however, on today's call was to kind of plant some flags in the sand and say, look, this is an area that you need to, you need to learn more about, yeah. okay? So I would say, first pass for this conversation, be aware that the application or use of these drugs has the potential to create hypertensive outcomes, raise blood pressure. Be aware that the application of these drugs has the potential to raise angiotensin II, the effect the molecule of the RAS system. This is not a desirable outcome. And we should bring something, quote unquote, something to suppress the elevation of that effector molecule. Okay. That would be the first step towards cardiac health, that, that conversation. Yeah. The uh, second conversation, and this is why I go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, I don't know about yourself, but obviously when I'm looking, I'm, I'm cause obviously you, you look at more blood work than I do, but both of us look at quite a significant amount of blood work. And mm. I would say that virtually everyone I see, even on very low dosages and lads haven't been doing it that long. The red blood cell counts are all going up. The blood pressures are all going up. And these are lads who are not taking that high dosages and they're already seeing those effects. And those Correct. effects are only going to compound over the five years, the 10 years, because how long are we going to do it for? Most lads, it's, it's going to be not a couple of years. This is almost a lifestyle that now, they're now changing to. Mm. And that's what we have to understand that you might be okay in that first few years, but it's, it's are you still going to be okay in 10 years and 15 or 20 on when you're having a heart attack at 50? because you've mm. not watched your stuff when you started it in tw at 20 years old. And this is- Well, it's interesting you say that because that kind of, that's a very nice little segue to the next, the, the next part of heart health, which is um, the very well understood consequence of application of androgens. And that is, you know, what we would call lipid skewing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is something when, when we looked at your blood work, your pathology work together, we saw some lipid skewing. Yeah. Where we had suppression mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, HDL cholesterol carriers. I think you had elevation of LDL cholesterol carriers, Rock. Well. Is that correct? It was both ways up, up with well, the. So, so mine was done. I, I mean, I, <laughs> I should get it up really. I mean, mm. it was done on Meditech. So in the UK, we use Meditech. If anyone's obviously not from the UK, it's, it's the, the main body that we use for private blood testing. Uh, and it comes in sort of a, a red or green, whether it's in or out of range. So my, my, my lipids are normally all in range. The only one that was off was. HDL on my blast last year was it's meant to be 0.1 or above, no, so 1.1 or above, and I was at one exactly. But everything mm -hmm. else is in range. So, and that was on a blast. But then we come this year, my HDL's halved, and all the others are now in the red as well. So it was mm -hmm. a case of, right, but obviously our discussion the other day, that's the first port of call of things. Well, I've already come onto a cruise anyway, but this needs to be dealt with now because mm -hmm. it's been like that for. They had already started to get skewed back in December when I got bloods. We're now in March, we've got bloods again. And then it's a case of if I continue down this road, we're going to start to see some more problems crop up. So it needs to be fixed now. But this is why the blood work's important as well. Yeah. So let's just talk a little bit about uh, 
the different compounds that you potentially could expose yourself to in our community and the different magnitudes of impact they have on cholesterol skewing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it is fair to say that um, different compounds affect skewing in different ways. As a general rule of thumb, mm-hmm. it's fair to say that oral steroids, those that we take by mouth, have a far greater impact on HDL cholesterol suppression yeah. than do injectable drugs. Okay, so uh, the injection of testosterone as a parental deposit basically does cause a, a very, very moderate suppression of HDL cholesterol, but it's very small in the grand scheme of things. Um, drugs like Provirin don't affect you know, lipids, but uh, as soon as we move into the, uh, you know, the DHT base, like you know, Anavar does, I mean, about 20 milligrams of Anavar a day will result in about approximately you know, 25 to 30% suppression of HDL cholesterol levels in a healthy young man. So that's a fairly significant, you know, suppression. Um, however, there are certain drugs that are notorious for this. The drug stenozolol or commonly called as Winstrol is, is notorious for this. I've seen um, guys take stenozolol and literally push their lipid HDL cholesterol carrier profile into the single digits overnight. It's, yeah. it's, Brutal, brutal on lipid skewing. Mm. The question, of course, is, okay, so how serious is that? And, and what are the ramifications? More importantly, so what's the consequence of that behavior? That's the, the question we should be asking. And I think it's fair to say that uh, HDL suppression is a very controversial subject. There's a great many people out there that would argue that uh, it's a card that is overplayed during mm. and that you know it doesn't have as great a magnitude of consequence during as it, it might do but i think it's important for us in our community to understand this and that is i think that's fair in the trt community because that's really that's the discussion we hear people saying oh you know that the, the hdl cholesterol suppression argument is overplayed i agree if you're talking about trt in other words the mm. physiological range of testosterone because we have studies that basically show that even though we see a, a moderate skewing of HDL carriers, okay, the consequence on a physiological level is, for all intents and purposes, what we call statistically insignificant. In other words, even though we see skewing, it doesn't affect uh, our, our, us on a physiological level. Yeah, and okay? I suppose we have to also factor in how skewed are they? I guess, I guess yeah, this is the yeah. point. This is where I'm going big with this, factor. right? Yeah. So, so, the, so that's the TRT argument, and I will listen to that argument all day, but that's not us. That's not our community. I think it's, it's disingenuous for us to say, look, we can look at that argument that's going on right now saying, look, the degree of skewing that you see with the administration of injectable testosterone is of small consequence to therapeutic outcomes. I, I agree, but that's not us. Yeah. We're, we're taking things a, a, a step further. And so you have to ask yourself the question, okay, so are there any studies out there that actually look at this in our community, in our cohort? In other words, actual anabolic and antigenic steroid users, not, not testosterone replacement cohort, yeah? And in 2018, 2019, a study was actually done that looked exactly at this, which is perfect for our conversation this is interesting what you said about the um about the study that you're involved in it, that that study that you're involved in uh is is slightly different from this because this is specifically asking the question about uh hdl cholesterol suppression and the consequence of that on our um on our arterial health so they did a study and basically what they looked at was they took uh groups of individuals, not a large number of people, but usually these studies are done in groups of like 20 type people. So they had 20 anabolic steroid users, 20 lifters who didn't use anabolic steroid and 20 sedentary, uh, sorry, 10 uh, sedentary individuals as a control group. And what they basically said was, okay, so if we, if we measure these, uh, these anabolic steroid users, what are on average is the consequence of their behavior. Now, they weren't given a specific cycle. This was basically just clustered together saying, look, these guys use, these guys don't. Um, and what they basically determined was that they saw a range of, and I'm going to use different units than you use because uh, this is an American study. I'm sure you're aware in the UK and America, those different units. And so I, I will use the uh, American units here. What they saw was that 
um, the range of cholesterol, HDL cholesterol carrier levels uh, in those 20 individuals ranged from 13 milligrams per deciliter to about 25. Okay, now to put that into context, um, the sedentary control group were at about 50 milligrams per deciliter. The trainers that did not use steroids were about 44. So in other words, if, if we consider the control group to be the lifters that didn't use anabolic steroids is 44 milligrams per deciliter, we saw those levels approximately half down to 19, but the, but the range was from 13 to 25. Okay, so that's the first part of the study. And then we have to ask ourselves the question, okay, so we know and we expect to see that type of suppression. That's no surprise, yeah. okay? The question is then, right, so does that suppression cause consequence? Do we see something in the arterial health of these individuals? In other words, do we see an accumulation of total coronary plaque volume, okay? And the answer is in 25%, of those 20 individuals, there was a elevated level of coronary plaque volume. Okay. That's not something to sneer at. Yeah. Okay. I mean, obviously I was just going to say, if, if everyone, anyone doesn't know, if you imagine obviously your artery and that, and it's got the plaque buildup inside the surface area inside is obviously a lot smaller then, which would pretty much straight away increase your blood pressure because there's less space. Mm -hmm. And this is when it's important to try and open up these blood vessels and get rid of this plaque, reducing the blood pressure quite easy, yep. easily. And obviously, and, 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 part, part, and again, we're using very simple language here, but the role of the HDL cholesterol carry is really to carry that poor plaque away for disposal. Yeah. 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 Okay. So by lowering our capacity to do that work, right, by lowering our, our levels, and this is where it's interesting because people say, oh, it's, a, it's about the particle size, it's about this, about that. You have to remember that that discussion is about TRT, guys. That's not about anabolic steroid users, right? I, I support that discussion. I'm not arguing that discussion. But that doesn't hold true when you step into our tribe. When you step into our tribe, 20 guys, they measured their levels. They saw suppression from about 44 to about 19. Let's just call them units to keep things nice and simple for people to understand, right? Each country, the different countries have different units. That's fairly heavy reduction. Of, that's 50% reduction. And that resulted in a impingement of the capacity of that, that carrier to do its work, to carry off the, the cholesterol, right? To carry off the, the coronary plaque, correct? Yeah. I'm sorry. And then okay. yeah, I suppose if we also combine that with the, the, the old fashioned, we just need to eat calories to get big. So the guys then are blasting a lot of gear, taking poor quality food, we could call it, causing higher inflammation, mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of water retention, the body's overly inflamed, which we see from high dosages in the first place. We see that level yep. of inflammation, which I was seeing. These all compound together to make the problem even more significant. Yeah, agreed. So then what we have to do is like, you know, dig a little further into the study. And what we begin to see is that the, the relationship of those, those individuals, that 25% of the 20, you know, so N equals 20, um, the guys who basically showed up as having significant increases in coronary plaque volume uh, actually did, were turned out to be the guys that had had the greatest or the longest exposure to anabolic steroids. Yeah, which is exactly okay. what we obviously something. So in other words, this is not something that presents itself in the first year of use or the second year of use. But in other words, yeah. the longer that you use, use these products, there's very likely, and we have to be very careful with the language you use here, very likely to see a greater elevation of risk that you become a candidate for falling into this trap. So in other words, uh, suppression of HDL cholesterol level needs to be viewed through the filters of not just acute, but long-term consequence. Mm -hmm. So you do it for a long time, there's a correlation between then you, you're probably, probably going to end up with elevated plaque accumulation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Long time. So it's not just suppression of this, this carrier. It's how long you do it for. Which is, okay. as we've discussed, it, who, who, whoever does one cycle, even if they just say they're going to do one, Nobody. it's very rarely one. <laughs> Most people don't it, even it, seem it, to come off these days. It is a, it is a blasting cruise. And I discussed it in a post that most people's idea of a cruise is not coming onto t actual TRT into natural ranges, which it's supposed to be. Mm. They're still st the, the psychological impact so that they feel they can't come down that low because they'll lose loads of size and they were almost becoming psychologically dependent on that higher dosage. Mm. And, but then if you've used the drugs to sort of shortcut 
poor training, poor diet, and then the drugs have done a lot of the work, you are going to see a big decrease when you come down. Mm. And then it's keeping people on higher doses, so these problems are never even able to be fixed mm. because you're still blasted the entire time. So, that, I mean, that, that's a, an excellent point because it leads me to this. What separates me from your doctor is this. So your doctor is going to berate you for this behavior. Yeah. Right? You know, what, what I'm going to do is kind of try to offer you a solution to say, look, you know, like it's, we're not going to stop doing what we're doing. So how do we, how do we get it? What's the workaround here? There, there must be a workaround, right? Yeah. So there's a couple <laughs> of workarounds. The first workaround, let's go back to our issue about uh, you know, the, the, the blood pressure and the cardiac remodeling, and then we come back to this. Yeah. So blood pressure, it's really simple. If you don't own a blood pressure monitor, you need to buy one, mm. okay? And I want you to measure your blood pressure every single week, okay? The, the markers, the current markers that are put into place for the general community and understanding that our general community, a lot of people talk about natural range, and I think this is like some good thing. You have to understand natural range means the average American or the average, you know, you know, English. And that's not necessarily good, right? I, I don't see average as, as, as a high water benchmark, you know, necessarily. Yeah, so, I would say for blood pressure, especially with the average population of the UK and America going to such a poor state of health, that average yep. level is probably going to increase. Yeah. The, the top, the upper limit is probably going to increase. And well, we're trying to be athletes, which you know, you kind of want to be somewhere towards not the bottom of blood pressure because that would see a dip in performance, but certainly not. Yeah, I, I also think it's 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 a little naive to think that users of anabolic steroids are even going to be in the middle range, <laughs> quite bluntly. I mean, like if you are, fabulous, don't get me wrong. I mean, like I would go kudos to you, but I would say that if you're a bigger guy, if you're 250 pounds kind of like Mark and you're using anabolic steroids and you can stay within the markers of, of, of general recommendation, which would be 140 uh, milligrams of mercury over 80, 140 over 80. That's, that's, that's kudos to you. Good, good for you. Right now, obviously lower is better, but we have to be practical. Like we're big guys. We're using steroids. So that I think that's a very good marker. And I try myself, to keep myself against that benchmark yeah mm. just something people ask a lot is okay so what is considered to be unhealthy if you went to your doctor and that was your blood pressure he would at that point probably trying to introduce some type of intervention to lower that i'm not saying that's low what i'm saying is that that's considered to be the upper benchmark and i think mm. for our community we just have to be realistic and say we're probably going to be bouncing against that during mm. and and then medication is typically pulled out of the drawer by medical providers at about 150 over 90. So between 140 over 80 and 150 over 90, they'll try and bring that into check with dietary interventions and lifestyle and behavioral changes. There are some supplements that, you know, we'll talk about in a minute that you know, can, can be used to, to modulate that to effect. But at the end of the day, you know, these, these medications, the ACE inhibitors and the angiotensin receptor blockers typically are pulled out the drawer at about 150 over 90. So, the point I'd like to make there is from a hypertensive treatment point of view, then it's fair to say, like a lot of people ask me, well, if I, if I have okay blood pressure, do I still need to take a blood pressure medication? I would argue you should take one anyway, because you want to still suppress angiotensin too, and understanding that these compounds are protective of the kidney. Okay. Yeah. Outside of, outside of any consequence they have on blood pressure, Right they are protective on the kidney by their mechanism of action. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say from, from my opinion, it's, you'd want it as, lo as low as you can bring it without impacting your performance in the gym and in terms of mm -hmm. muscle gain. So then mm -hmm. if it's okay, well, but then if it can be better and mm -hmm. the medication isn't impacting your progress in the gym, you've, and mm -hmm. then why, why not have it better? If these, because obviously this, th there's been a big, stigma with these medications that mm. they make you feel terrible, they'll stop mm. muscle gain and all things like this. And <laughs> then, then, then we've seen that that's not, that's not let me, true. Let me, let me tell you the easiest yeah. way to get guys to take an, an ARB. I can provide some evidence of this if anyone wants to see it. Telemasartan is a myostatin inhibitor. So if, okay. they don't, if they don't know what myostatin there is, you myostatin go. <laughs> the hormone that stops you essentially gaining muscle past a certain point. And it's one yeah. thing we want to keep low all the time. And a lot of people are looking for this magic drug that's going to suppress it so they can gain endless amounts of muscle. People are <laughs> spending stupid amounts of money chasing the myostatin inhibition wagon. And, and yeah. it's fair to say, if I'm very honest, let's be honest, let's be transparent. The challenge is that 
we are not yet, you know, well informed enough about its clinical implications. In other words, does the magnitude of myostatin inhibition consequential to the application of an ARB like losartan or telemosartan actually has, does it actually have clinical therapeutic effect? We know that in natural women it does. In other words, if you take natural women and give them this drug, the consequential myostatin inhibition results in an improvement in composition. Well, it in actually, wasn't it actually put on the WADA uh, banned list for a short time? It was, it was evaluated for consideration. And then one of the things about these drugs is that they, one of the markers they look at, you have to understand this is a business, yeah? Hmm. And they look at the number of athletes that are potentially abusing the drug and then consider whether they'll test for it or not. Mm. In other words, if it's not a heavily used drug, it makes no commercial sense to test for it. Okay. So mm. telemosartan was actually considered as a drug candidate. There is an argument to be made that it has merit as a, a performance enhancing drug. It's certainly abused as a performance enhancing drug by the, by the endurance cycling community, but uh, it's not in common enough use in athletics for them to consider testing for it. Okay, so it's an interesting orphan in that regard. Even the fact then that it's been considered and it is yeah. used shows yeah. that it's obviously not going to impact performance. And if anything, it would actually increase. It's a, it. And that's the point I'm making. Exactly. People that think it's going to impact performance. If anything, if you want to make an argument about that, and I'm not, I'm not actually walking around saying people, you should take this because this is going to produce a, an increase. What we can say about telling Masartan is because of its PPAR agonist properties, it is the only you know, hypertensive medication is both an, uh, an angiotensin receptor blocker and a PPAR agonist. And, and what a PPAR agonist means for in, in layman's terms is it's a metabolic modulator. You will actually see a reduction in fat deposits. It, it, it lowers visceral body fat, mm -hmm. right? But it actually also has the potential, almost like every other performance enhancing tool in our box, most tools, whether they're clenbuterol or whether it's something like telemosartan, if it lowers body fat, chances are that it also has the potential to be a hypertrophic agent through some mechanism of action. Again, clenbuterol is a great example. Most men see clenbuterol through the filters of fat burning. It's clearly demonstrable as a hypertrophic agent. Most people see a PPAR agonist as a fat burner, you mean, and telemosartan certainly lowers visceral body fat, but it also has the potential to work as a hypertrophic agent through consequence of being a myostatin inhibitor. So I find that if I tell people it's a myostatin inhibitor, they can't get they can't get their wallet out fast enough to buy the stuff. But if it's a blood pressure medication, they don't need it. Yeah, because a, <laughs> a lot of people know what that means. And and, and, and the PPAR um, uh, is a PPAR agonist. You said yeah. Um, is also cardarine. Cardarine would be in that category, Correct. isn't it? So then that, that comes into. Let, let me just mention cardarine because a yeah. lot of people know cardarine as a PPR agonist. Let me just explain about cardarine. Yeah. So cardarine was a, a a compound that's very re relevant to this conversation because it was actually being evaluated by Glaxo Smith as a uh, as an agent that could be used for the improvement of lipid skewing, and that's what it does really well. Mm. Okay. And there was a, some human trials. It looked really, really promising. It does very, very nicely at very low doses, even 2.5 to 5 milligrams a day, serious consequential elevation of HDL carriers. Really, really interesting drug. Mm. The problem with it was, is it was looking so promising that Glaxo was forced as part of the FDA approval process to put it through standardized, and I'll repeat that, standardized toxicology testing, where they effectively give this drug to rats and mice for two years at a hyper dose, to see whether it is a basically carcinogen and every single dose they tested failed mm. every dose right from three milligrams up fail 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 all of the animals produce basically you know cancerous outcomes and so glaxo put their arms up there and walked away from it it's a, that's a lost cause and unfortunately people like to make up bullshit about that testing saying oh it's unfair it was too much why would people use that much why for two years what you understand is the drug telemosartan, right, the same thing. was put through the same fucking test and it passed. So fuck you, basically, is the yeah. answer. To me, is that, <laughs> like if it was, so telemosartan never had to pass that test, I would agree that's unfair. But telemosartan had to pass the same test and the yeah. test is the test and it's not set by the pharmaceutical manufacturers, it's set by the FDA, right? Yeah. It's standardized toxicology testing. Now, that does not mean that if you use cardarine, you're going to get cancer. What it basically means is that it's identified as a carcinogen. And the best analogy I can use for that, there's lots and lots of people that smoke their whole life and never got cancer, mm. right? 
doesn't mean fucking smoking is not a carcinogen, yeah. right? But we also then, if we add smoking and cardarine and drinking, and 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 and, and, and I made a post. Correct. I made a post on my uh, Instagram the other day that confused the fuck out of people. I'll, tr- I'll, tr- I'll try to explain that, and then and then. So there is a discussion at the moment that says, okay, there are certain drugs that we take that have the potential to raise our, um, like raise a, a, a cancerous precondition. Okay, what that means is that cancer is basically correlated to this, the turnover of stem cells in certain organs, okay? And anabolic steroids have the potential to raise the turnover of stem cells. People can understand that, yeah? yeah. Okay. Uh, through the action of you know drugs like nandrolone, primobolum, and pretty much let's just say all androgens have the potential to escalate the production and turnover of stem cells. That's part of the physiological response of tissue growth. Okay, there is a correlation between cancerous outcomes and and an increase in stem cells. It's not necessarily correlated to, to anabolic steroids, but that is what we would call a precondition that might that might possibly set you up for like a higher exposure profile to cancer so Mm. if that was true if that was true it wouldn't make sense then to start using drugs that are potential carcinogens does it make sense so we're not going to use we're not going to stop using nandrolone and we'll stop using prima bowl and stop using masteron because they might set up a potential precondition for cancer but what we would do is say well if that's true then maybe we want to avoid drugs that have a question mark hanging over them yeah, especially with a, a chronic usage. And this is correct. This Absolutely. Is, and this yeah, is the point. And, this is with lots of stuff. And, and we're going to talk about GW in a minute when I talk about treatment methodologies for, for cholesterol skewing. It's an option. But I wouldn't use it as a fat loss agent. I wouldn't use it as a as a metabolic modulator because that requires quant- chronic application. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So let's just talk about then. So they did this test. They found out they saw significant LDL uh, carrier suppression, consequential of the application of these things in these 20 individuals. 25% of those 20 guys were seen to have elevated levels of coronary plaque volume. That's a significant enough number to grab your attention. Okay. Mm. So what do we do about it? I would argue this. The way to, to address this is to look at the numbers. So in other words, um, those 20 individuals that were tested showed HDL cholesterol carrier levels of basically 19 milligrams per deciliter. That was average from 13 to 25 units. Okay. Now, because of the way I create cycle programs, I look at that number and go, holy fuck, that's low. Yeah. Most of my clients, I'm able to keep above 40, right? And here's the interesting thing. When you look at the non-steroid users trained, Okay, so the sedentary control was 50 units. The non-steroid users were 44 units. The steroid users was 19 units. But I am, through my cycle design methodology, is able to keep most people above 40, which is very, very fucking damn near fucking natural, you mm-hmm. know, in that thing. Okay, so did any of the natural people at 40 have coronary heart problems? None. Yeah. Okay, so the, the takeaway here is this. Do we have to, as enhanced users, suppress our HDL levels to that level? No. Why would you do that? <laughs> like, in other words, yeah. it's cycle design. It's the choice of drugs and it's the choice of the behaviors. And it's also the choice of, so are there any preventative measures that we can put in place that run parallel to this that allow us basically to recognize the problem and say, that's very true, but that's not me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so what I would say to people is this, how do we avoid being in the category of people that saw that type of suppression, right? So the first thing is, you would basically not use drugs like Winstrol. You just say, I'm not going to use that, that class of drugs. I'm going to, for the most part, stick with drugs that show some level of suppression, but not a large magnitude. The one exception to that would be, I am a fan of Anavar, but I never have Anavar running all the time. Yeah, I, I, I often follow the protocol of if you're going to put orals in, I rather use them, use them at the end of a blast, whether it's conference mm. prep or anything else as well, and pre-training, so then you're not using them on, on training days, which kind of offsets that a little bit. Because then it's, uh, it's not yeah, primary, there's, there's, it's more there's, of a there's pro- there's, every, every increment you can take down, there's probably a, 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 a discussion to be had about minimising that impact, yeah? 
But yeah. the biggest thing to me would be this and getting guys to understand there are certain products that we can put on the table that have demonstrated clinically their capacity to mitigate HDL suppression. Okay. So the obvious question begs, well, what are those, right? Now, I've already introduced one of those is GW1516. Very effective at this, even at doses as low as 2.5 milligrams a day. It's a, a very effective agent at raising it, raising our HDL carrier levels. Okay. If, you, if you're saying for, on, on that front, would, would you advocate then running it through an entire blast? No. Yeah, no, because because, 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 because of the it, yeah. concerns over its toxicology. Yeah. yeah. The way so I would look at this drug and say, that's a really interesting drug candidate, but let's put that aside because we have some concerns. Mm. Yeah. So what's the next one up? The, the next one up is <clears throat> time <Tell him aside. laughs> Okay. So tell him aside, we can run them the whole time. You're supposed to be using it every day for fucking yeah. any, anyway. This is the beauty of this drug. This is what I call like the Swiss Army knife of fucking of drugs like it, it's it's like most people go oh, are you fucking kidding me like hair loss fucking kidney protective cardiac protective you know da, 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 da. what what doesn't it do you know, and I know i know that's a joke but you have to understand the reason that it's such a powerful tool is because of its mechanism of action it does two things it suppresses angiotensin 2 and just the suppression of angiotensin 2 is probably the number one thing you can do for your overall cardiac and renal health okay that's why it has seems to have such a big impact it's also has certain antioxidant properties so this is where it starts to benefit us and benefit us in, in hair loss protocols and things like this and in this particular application it, it it demonstrates its capacity because it is a metabolic modulator as well it's the only arb that is both a an a, a hypertensive medication and a metabolic modulator in this instance, because it's a metabolic modulator, we see a consequential improvement in lipid profile. Okay, now it does take time, and this is the limitations of most of these drugs. When you look at the GW drug, it's not like you take it and tomorrow it's fixed. Yes, I mean, okay. all, all these things are going to take time because they, they, take, they time. take some time. Take time. Yeah, it's correct. So the improvements that we saw in uh, like uh, HDL profiles from Telemisartan, right? it takes months it takes months to, to lift it up but the point is is that you start it now in three years time from now it will probably have had a very significant contribution to improving your lipid profile mm. okay the second uh tool that i would put on the table is taurine now taurine is something you should be taking anyway are you right there yeah sorry i just got a phone call and it flipped onto my laptop <laughs> cool. Everything's so, so, so taurine, taurine is a uh, is a product that is has a demonstrable capacity to help mitigate the consequences of the application of anabolic steroids on suppression of HDL cholesterol levels. Highly recommended. Product. I did not know that because I've yeah. been using, I use taurine because obviously if you get it in powder form, I, I think some of the guys try and use capsules sometimes, but to get a decent dosage of things like taurine. You yep. end up with a handful of capsules where the powder yep. is incredibly cheap yep. and has so many other applications, which this is one that I yeah, can correct. Realize. Yep. So yeah. I, I so you can see where I'm going here is like if you actually create a cycle intelligently, okay, mm. you can actually offset a lot of these concerns before they even begin. Yeah. Right. So the simple application of saying, look, from day one, I'm going to introduce an ARB to my regime, this takes never have to donate blood again this takes care of the hypertension problem this takes care of the left ventricular cardiac remodeling problem this takes care of you know some of the renal stress this takes care but basically through its metabolic modulator of assisting us with fat loss it's plausibly a a myostatin inhibitor i have, I have no problem arguing with someone arguing the merits of yes but to what clinical impact uh, fair call we don't know yes in natural women Mm, not sure in men women are exquisitely sensitive to these inputs you so yeah. you can give a woman 40 milligrams of micro uh, of clenbuterol and see a consequential improvement in hypertrophy yeah men eh, nothing the, the fucking needle didn't yeah. move right yeah. so we it, it may well be fair to say that yes in women it is a myostatin inhibitor but in men it doesn't have a large enough significant impact for us to consider in the same way that i'm not sure you whether aware of it but uh creatine creatine monohydrate in inhibits myostatin inhibition 
Yeah. Okay. So well, myostatin elevation, sorry. It's a, yeah. it's yeah, a myostatin so inhibitor. inhibitor. Yeah. yeah, correct. Yeah. It's a, it, it, it helps us in this regard. Now, yeah. again, the question is to what clinical significance we don't really know. Yeah. yeah. All right. So you can see where I'm going with this is the whole story, if we start to close it round to the beginning, says these are fucking real problems. Mm. You know, 25% of the men they studied in this study using anabolic steroids saw an increase in coronary plaque volume. That's nothing to be fucking sticking your head in the sand about, right? Mm. But it's also, in my opinion, not, you know, an outcome that you have to choose. All you need to do is say, look, by careful drug selection in the first place, the drugs that have a stimulatory impact on the suppression of HDL, and by choosing some ancillary agents that basically help us to mitigate those behaviors, right? Mm. We can actually design a cycle that is, you know, a, a little bit better than agricultural, right? That has the potential to take many of these problems off the table for us. Now, mm. how do we confirm that? Because this is the question. It's all very well and good to fucking for me to sit on my fucking soapbox and pontificate and say, like, you know, this is my this is my thesis, this is my fucking hypothesis, right? It's mm. pretty simple. Does it control our blood pressure? We buy a blood pressure monitor. Yeah. Right? Does it modulate and mitigate cardiac remodeling? Well, we get a yellow echocardiogram to confirm this. Yeah. Yeah. And then when we when we start to look at things, you know, each each of these models, when we look at you know uh, the increase in coronary plaque volume, you can get a calcium score check done. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the same testing methodology that they used on these individuals to determine whether they had been impacted by this event we can go and do this on demand mm. right so how many people in our community doing that i'm telling you two tenths of fuck all it does happen i do know people that do it but not very many do you mean and so what i would suggest is the interesting thing behind this is not only can i present a an overarching thesis this is you know, the, our, our, our model for prevention of deleterious impact on cardiac health. This is our treatment methodology for a preventative, you know, uh, medication methodology. But we also can follow that up with a, with a nice little roundout saying, and we can basically confirm our hypothesis by making sure that we measure our blood pressure, making sure that we get an echocardiogram, making sure that we get a calcium score check and done on a... On, on, a, on a regular basis now how often do you need to get that i think that you should measure your blood pressure every week yeah. i think that you should get your pathology work done every 12 weeks as you do very nice yeah i think that you should get an echocardiogram done once a year and given the outcome of this particular study the fact that the guys who were affected by this the most were the guys that have been using the drugs the longest mm -hmm. right it's probably something you don't need to do every year but if you're going to be a long time user like me, right, yeah. you should actually probably you know, put it on your list of things to do. Like the longer you've been using these drugs, the more important it probably becomes. Yeah. I mean, yeah? I, I'd say I don't, I don't know things like where you are. I think I, I, I've been working here in Thailand. You're, you're in Thailand, aren't you? So, Correct. Yeah. So I, I think you can you can pay for things quite readily from what I hear. Um, hmm. over, over here in the UK yeah, just on demand you walk, walk yeah. into the local hospital and say line me up you know? yeah yeah whereas here in the UK we hit a lot of resistance it seems with testosterone because they seem to demonize that and, and from the lads that I've talked to especially when they're younger it's more here's some antidepressants here's some Viagra not here's some testosterone however when you seem to hit this limit of 40 years old they seem to go okay we'll test you for bloods we'll test you for this we'll test you for that quite easily but I think from, from my own experience, when it's come to stuff like cardiac health, because it's been a problem for so much longer, they mm. seem to be a little bit more willing for the medications. If you're going in, your blood pressure is always high, mm. then they seem to be more willing to prescribe those things. So it's a bit mm. easier to get them on prescription and to send I, you for these further testing, which you can only do going through the GP here. You'd have to go GP okay. specialist. I, I think that's, that's, that's very fair. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's only true that your ability to access on-demand testing, whether it's imaging, whether it's pathology, doesn't matter what it is, right? Mm -hmm. That That is going to be different in every country of the world. Yeah. yeah. And it's probably going to be different for different individuals based on their relationship with their primary healthcare provider. I live in the utopia that says, 
as long as you have money in your pocket, you can everything you fucking goddamn please. <laughs> like you just literally walk into the hospital and say, light me up. I want the whole fucking thing. And they go, have you got enough money? Yep. No problems. Here we go. Yeah. Right. And, and then so, it's paid for it, 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 but you just have to. Yeah. Well, that's the advantage it. is you have a healthcare system that potentially means that you don't have to pay for it. But a point I'm making is I am empathetic to the fact that people will often, you know, lament the process that like, you know, in their country, this and in their country, that, but here, let me, let me give you a word of advice for those people. Um, just remember that, like, by comparison to the 1970s and the 1980s, I started training in 1985, yeah? Um, by comparison to, to, to that, well, actually, that's probably before that, come to think of it, yeah, but close enough, whatever. But in the 1985, there was no one-demand pathology centers like iMedical or, you know, in like any, anything like that. It was, it, it's, it's so much better today, right, that it's ridiculous, and so I have a certain degree of empathy, but I also think that, you know, so what would you have done 10 years ago? During like, if you can't make your way today with all of the improvements that we've seen in, in willingness to provide these types of services, right? It's much, 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 much better than it was. Yeah, I mean, making. like I say, yeah. with, with, with Medichex here, it's, yep. it, you literally, you order it, it's here within a day, you send yep. it off, you get your results in two days. Boom. And, and that's, that's something that's come around in the last four or five years. I know this is what a lot of guys don't don't realize how fucking cool that is, right? Because there was yeah. a time when it was tough, you know. Like, and in some part, in some parts of the world, it's fair to say it still is tough. Canada is one of those countries where they're, yeah. they're just now starting to open up, like on demand. There's like I think there's one facility in Ontario that does on demand. So the point I'm making is, depending on where you live in the world, your your experience here is going to be different. Yeah, but yeah. that 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 blood work on demand has then allowed so many more people to get it done and and done regularly that's then allowed people mm. like you and me to then read this blood work and then talk to each other. So then, although yep. there's not so much clinical data, there's all this anecdotal data that we're all now sharing because people are being more open. And that's Agreed. when we're all starting to learn a hell of a lot more about, okay, this is the things that are going on that we Agreed. didn't realize until this last few years. We, we, we are in the middle of a educational information revolution. It's a very yeah. exciting time. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously using technology, then you, like I say, people from different parts of the world, they're now yeah. communicating with each other, which is also important. Yeah. Just a few years ago, this wasn't possible. <laughs> <laughs> not, not very long ago, this was a, uh, a a major investment to set up a video link between two countries and have, have two guys talk about this sort of stuff. So it's a, it's a, a truly, truly remarkable time to be alive and, and a part of our community. So, yeah. Yeah. Because cool. like I, said, when, I mean, when I first started, I shared the books with someone yesterday and they were, they were these, because I read five books before I did anything and took 18 mm -hmm. months to make the decision. But that allowed me to have yep. a, better, a better perception because although the, the drug designs were terrible in this book, but conservative. So my perception mm. was the conservative route. And obviously until this last blast, I decided to do a bit of an experiment as, a, as we, we mm. went through in the call and push things higher. But mm. lads had are doing that from the get-go sometimes going up to these ridiculous mm. amounts because mm. their perception is can, can, so can we talk a, I, I will i will i will be very discreet but i would like to talk about this because this is uh, this is the opportunity for me to talk to people very transparently about what they're doing this is what i said to you on that call like you know so we saw some markers from that blood work that i think need to be addressed and you recognize that and acknowledge that and, and taking action but the point i'm making is that the reason those markers are there is because of choices that you made and they don't need to be there if you don't want them to be there. This is what I try to get across the message. I have no problem with guys that want to put their foot down and push the envelope, right? I'm not here to convince anyone of anything. All I'm simply saying is, look, that's your choice. And, and through the choices you make for compound selection and dose, those choices are going to determine consequences like, so how badly do you skew HDL? Yeah. Mm. And the consequence of how badly you choose HDL has the potential long term to change the implications for your health. If you don't push hard, if you choose the right drugs, in my opinion, and my 35 years of experience in this, you don't have the consequences that we see in that study. Those consequences are the result of choice, not default application of these drugs. What the drugs you choose the amount you choose and the way that you approach cycle design, what, what, what supportive drugs you might build in there, yeah, are the determinants of whether or not you see HDL. And this is what I was saying to you on the call last time, saying it's my hope 
that you might look at that and go, well, that was an interesting experience. And I certainly learned something about myself and about the drugs and about stress and that process. But maybe I will decide to do that again or not do that again, based on now the information I have about what it did to my pathology work. Yeah. But I'd also, I'd also like to add that I feel my training was impacted by the end yep. because my body was getting so inflamed. Things like lower back pumps were inhibiting training. Training's yep. been impacted, but training's also been sporadic. So obviously in the UK, we've had gyms open, gyms closed. Yeah, with the closures, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's what made it. So my training wasn't what it was sure. in, in between sort of August and October when we went into lockdown again. That was the best point of training, and I was on lower drugs. And then I pushed the drugs up. My training's not been as productive. Mm. And I would much rather, which is what a lot of guys aren't doing, they push drugs and not training. If you push yeah. training... <laughs> Push training, I'll see fatigue, but I wouldn't have seen the internal the internal issues. And in my opinion, I would see better progress. And that's one point that's really important to point out that yeah. if the training is shit, you can't make up for, with drugs because all you're going to do is damage your health. Yeah. And then it short changes because then I've had to come off the blast. How long is this cruise going to be for? It's probably to going clean, to, be to, to clean things up. Yeah. yeah. And also just one, one, one extra feather in that cap. I totally agree with that. But I'd also point is very often as you raise the drug profile, you read a point of where the clinical, you know, consequence or the benefits of the therapy are overtaken by the toxic outcomes. And so like more is more up into a point, more is you know, more works more up into a point, but you get to a threshold that many, many young men have experienced where you go, you know what, like I got to the point, it all fucking fell apart. I, I couldn't eat properly. I yeah, didn't feel, exactly you know, right. and it's like, this is what I try to explain to guys is, more works more until more doesn't work anymore. And then you're better off taking fucking less. And, and I encourage everybody that, like, I don't want to give the wrong message, but uh, you should probably at some point, you know, reach out and try to feel for you where that threshold is so that you know it's there, Doreen. And then you can, you know, pull back a little bit from the edge and know, you know what, like now I'm sitting somewhere between minimum clinical effective dose and maximum therapeutic benefit balanced against toxic consequence. And, and find that sweet spot that just basically produces the best possible result for you at the lowest possible stress level. Yeah. And I'd also say yeah. if someone's not competing and they're not, especially if they're not competing professionally, yeah. that risk reward ratio should be shifted anyway. Because for, like for me, it should, it should be lower. Yeah. And what's happened in the last two weeks since coming onto the, onto the cruise with, especially this week, my sleep's mm -hmm. improved by about two hours a night. My resting heart rate's down yep. by seven beats. Yep. Um, my digestion's, perfect again my stomach's Improved. flat where it was yeah. i was getting acid reflux i was distended um i said my training was impacted because i was getting low back pumps my breathing was impacted all that's gone my fitness has gone back yeah. up my resting heart is down so all these things are, are quite quickly changed because we've yeah. just pulled that stress away and then especially yeah. when i'm sleeping better my training is now better because i'm going in the gym with way more energy yeah. so it, it's it's a it's a knock-on effect that actually now on a cruise just above the, the, the upper limit of the natural range, which to be mm. fair still falls in the American range. Mm -hmm. I'm actually feeling fantastic. My energy's through mm. the roof. I, mm. I'm waking up full of energy and mm. everything. My training is actually progressing better now than it was a few weeks ago. So we mm. see that I had gone way beyond that upper limit. And it's quite mm. clear that people are just not aware of how shit they're feeling. Because most of the guys that I speak to, it's mm. just test and trend, test and trend. But it's because trend's very forgiving. Because if you do everything wrong, you'll still get results. But then these are the same mm. ones who are not doing blood work. And this is why I'm going to have this conversation. I agree. Sing it yeah. to the choir, brother. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. And that's why we're on the same page a lot of stuff. Sing it to the choir. Yeah. Cool. All right. So how about we do this? How about we maybe wrap this call up here? Because I think that was a fabulous all like, day, thing. All yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, we've, we, we, we'll probably, maybe I'll get, give you a chance to marinate on this a little bit. We can come back and we can pick up some, additional segments as we go along sort of things to, based on how this is received i mean if there's interest i mean i'm i'm even open if you know you have if you want to place the question to you know people that follow you, you know, like you know what, what questions they want answered da, 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 da. but i think this is it's nice to have a a nicely bundled up discussion about a subject where people yeah. can then reference that rather than spill into too many things at once and then you're kind of like going where, where, where the hell was that kind of like piece of content that i wanted to watch i think it's a really interesting conversation i appreciate your time very much i appreciate your transparency and honesty and and coming on and sharing your experience and stuff like that so 
Thank you, mate. Appreciate that, Chris. Yeah. I, well, I mean, before we go, Victor, I'd like to obviously have, have you say, obviously we've got the websites and things and how people can contact you as well. Think okay, you thank you, mate. Yeah, so my my Instagram name is up there. It's been up there the whole time, Victor Black Masterclass at. And uh, for those that are interested in learning more, obviously I provide, I, I, I actually consider myself to be a specialist enhancement coach. I mean, like there, there are lots and lots of people out there that are just absolutely fabulous, you know, what I would call body composition and preparation coaches. And they have, they wear many hats. You know, if, if I was to describe myself, I ultimately would like to position myself as the coach's coach, you know, someone that is there to provide support and assistance for coaches regarding enhancement practices in our domain. I think I've got a little way to go to do that. That's my mission. That's how I'm trying to build my brand as that guy. Um, I, I run a couple of websites. I run a website for women that I just started last month called enhancedwomen.com. I run uh, victorblackmasterclass.com. And then in about uh, middle of the year, so probably three or four months from now, I'm planning to launch Coaching Academy, Prep Coach uh, Academy, which is really going to be a specialist facility to you know, uh, assist those professionals in our business that want to learn more about the application of enhancement practices in a, in a, in a quote unquote safer manner. So that's, that's not up yet. That's, that, that's coming. That's on the horizon, but anyone that wants to follow me, I, I, I appreciate your support at, at Victor Black Masterclass. Thank you. Yeah. Cause that's on me and Victor obviously connected in the first place. I booked a call with, with you two weeks ago, like I said, yep. because I went, I got my blood results and although I can interpret them to a degree, I wanted a, a second opinion from yourself to, to, to see, okay, how, how do you feel about this? Because I've seen a lot of stuff you've put out online and really liked your approach to things and obviously the safer usage model that you that you often preach to people, which I think mm. is is hopefully starting to go that way with people being more educated. We're getting there. One, one, yeah. one mind yeah. at a time. Hopefully. Can I just say can I just say something about that? Sorry, I I I, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I will I will take the advantage. I just want everyone to 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 try and understand I'm not here to convince anyone of anything, right? In other words, there are certain people in our community that know that the use of these drugs comes with risk they already know that i don't need to fucking convince them of it they go they i know right i my my mission is to help those people who already know right about okay so how might we mitigate that risk a lot of people think that i'm here to try and convince people like you know there's risk where there's not or you should do this or you shouldn't do that I'm telling you that the overwhelming number of enhancement users around the world, right, are not even yet ready to hear this message. I'm here to provide educational content for those individuals that say, look, we know there's risk. This is not, you don't need to convince me of that, Victor. I know there's fucking risk. Mm. What I want to know is what do you think I should do as a strategy to mitigate that risk? And this is the disconnect that I have a lot of people. People want to still argue with me about the risk. You're in, they're not necessarily arguing with me about the mitigation strategy. They're saying, well, you know, and I use veterinary drugs or I use research chemicals and there's fucking Psalms are completely safe and stuff like that. There's a whole bunch of people out there that are arguing there's no risk, there's no risk, there's no risk. My message, my content is not for those people. My message and content is for the people that say, look, I agree with you, Victor. Why am I using veterinary drugs? I agree with you, Victor. Why am I using drugs that were abandoned by the research pharmaceutical company 15 years ago? <laughs> Why am I doing that, right? Why am I using drugs that you know have never even been tested in a fucking rat? During like, why am I doing that? Those people that are asking why, in my experience, are looking for answers about how to do this in a safer way. That is my audience. That is who I'm trying to reach. I'm not trying to convince people that fucking Psalms aren't safe. If they believe that, if they want to believe that they're they're best served by using veterinary drugs, great. I'm not your mother. <laughs> yeah. I mean, can I say uh, that's that's the route? Obviously, I've gone down the last the sort of two or three years trying mm -hmm. to see. Okay, I understand there's risks, and I'm trying mm. to figure out how to mitigate them, which is when it sure. comes to the ARBs and ACE inhibitors and beta blockers and things like this, and, and trying to understand those drugs better, which is how yep. I found people itself. But I, I would also say, from in my opinion, anyone who thinks there's no risk is incredibly naive and a little bit <laughs> blind because we know these things are bad. But then, so okay, as long as you maybe do this and do it this way, you'll probably be okay as long as you don't do all these other lifestyle things as well, which we know altogether is, is going to do you some harm. 
Uh, the, you know. the analogy I always use, buddy, is the most dangerous thing in my life is I ride a motorcycle. Yeah. Right. Nothing even comes close that I do in enhancement practices. And if anyone wants to rock, knock on my door and say, you do realize that driving a motorcycle is a dangerous pursuit. I agree. I've been riding a motorcycle, however, since I was 15 years old. And I consider myself to be a very educated rider. Mm. I'm very careful. I make the right decisions. I Sometimes I don't ride because it's not the right weather conditions. Whenever I do ride, I, I wear the appropriate safety equipment. In other words, I try to emulate everything about you know, managing my dangerous hobby of motorcycle riding in my world of enhancement. I, in other words, I'm not sitting there trying to tell people it's not dangerous. What I'm trying to do is saying, if you do it the right way, if you're careful and deliberate and intentional and you use the right safety methodologies and best practice and get good guidance, go and get some you know, motorcycle riding lessons from someone that knows, that has good skills and that sort of stuff, you can enjoy motorcycle riding as a, as a pursuit for, for, for many, many decades like I have. Mm. But it's also fair to say that you can go and buy a Ducati and you know, ride down the street without a helmet, a pair of flip-flops on and kill yourself in the first fucking two, two minutes. Yeah, During, which is, these lads in holiday destinations all over the world. They all do yeah. it. They come to Thailand yeah. and fucking smack <laughs> themselves. Like, yeah, so the yeah. point I'm making is like, you know, I'm not delusional. I'm not telling people this doesn't have risk involved. I, I hope people, are, you never heard me say once in this, our something conversation safe safer during and risk mitigation not elimination yeah, yeah. so there's, there's, there's a lot of messaging i think this is a very valuable piece of content reflecting on in my mind now as we're closing up i think i hope i hope this this content reaches as many people as possible because i think it has the potential to save a great many people a great deal of pain over the next few decades of their lives yeah, and, and I hope it plants a seed with some lads who are actually unaware because of the bad advice they've been given. Because there is still quite a lot of people just going, no, no, they're safe, they're fine. <laughs> uh, and and it, it's it's that bad advice that we're trying to push out of, of the wayside, which is either old-fashioned where they didn't know. So there's a lot of naivety there. Um, and just, just trying to get this across to people that, no, there are risks. You do need mm. to do things more safely, and they can be done more safely. Mm. But that's not just getting some test and trend from some lad at the gym and not even knowing what you're taking. Okay. It's, it's, there's a lot of different things that go into it and it's going to be more complex, but it can be done. And you can get better results, but it also depends on cool. training and eating as well, not just not just the drugs, which we also need to highlight, okay. I think, is important. Cool. So, All right. right Victor, Thank you very much. Fantastic. Most enjoyable. Thank you, buddy. We'll talk to you soon, yeah? Okay, I'll speak to you later. Have a good night. Bye-bye. You too.